can I invite you to the book of Genesis, chapter 3. We have been in the book of Genesis since it was written. Oh, come on, that was great. And we're in chapter 3, but we're going to close this baby out today, pending no interruptions and no tangents or rabbit trails from the pulpit. I have plenty of time. Let's make sure this baby's turned off. Not that people call me. Genesis chapter 3, a most pivotal chapter in all the scriptures. Such explanatory power for all that we see in life and all that we read in scripture. It all roots back here to Genesis chapter 3. We have seen the serpent deceive Eve into eating of the forbidden tree. We have seen the result of them eating from that tree that God said not to eat from and instant shame and alienation happening between them and between them and God. We saw God last week uh, lay down the, the judgments against Satan, against the woman and against the man and the earth as a result of their sin. And we come finally to the last few verses, verses 20 through 24 uh, in chapter 3. And let's follow along as I read verses 20 through 24. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Father, these words are the words of life. Your spirit, whom you've given us, is the spirit of life living in us. God, may he lead and guide our hearts and our minds this morning that we might know and understand truth. God, that you would give us spiritual insight, eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts, Lord, fertile. I pray that we wouldn't have hard hearts this morning, God, but rather that we would have soft hearts, hearts that you can direct. So God, this morning, would you bless the preaching of your word, that it does not return to you void, but accomplishes all of your will in our lives. May each one of us be ready, Lord, to hear what you say to us today. Encourage those who need encouragement. Convict those who need conviction. Lord, and today, consecrate us further in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. So Adam names Eve... They are clothed by God, and then they're booted. So those are the three things happening in this text. Those are the three headings, essentially. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it a little uh, uh, better for those who like to take notes. A new name, new clothes, and a new home. Okay? So that's what these, uh, last, uh, this last section goes over. So let's look at a new name. Verse 20. When Adam... Oh, no, I'm over in chapter 5. Let's go back over to... Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. Oh, man. I thought this was going to be a short section to preach. This is rich, okay? So let's get into this. Number one, Adam names her. Now, before the fall, you'll remember in chapter 2 that when God brought Adam, uh, his wife, and he had never laid eyes on her before, he looked at her when she was approaching him, and he said, Behold, she shall be called woman. 
So Adam called her woman prior to the fall in chapter 2. And now after the fall, she's going to get another name. You might even say a more personal name from her husband. I took note that she doesn't remain nameless. She doesn't remain nameless. Names are important, aren't they? You ever try and name a kid when you guys can't agree? Let's name him Justin. Now it reminds me of someone I don't like. Uh, you remember that battle? Yeah, not you, me. <laughs> that wasn't a slam on you. <laughs> we name our kids. We name our fishing rods. Some of us name our guns. Some of us name our vehicles, right? We name our pets. Names are important because they show personhood. Not having a name, a name is like not being a person. It's like, somehow isn't that awful? Having a name as a reflection of the fact that you are a person, you have personhood, comes all in that whole image of God thing that we are created with. The image of God in us is where we get personhood. Why? Because we are made in God's image, who is the ultimate person. He is the one who has ultimate divine personhood. We have personhood because we're made in his image. God's name isn't revealed until Exodus chapter 3, the very next book in the Bible. He is, however, called some pretty amazing things in the book of Genesis. My favorite has to be when Isaac says, when he refers to God as the fear of Isaac. Isn't that an awesome title? Start referring to God. Rather than referring to God as Lord God or Almighty or the Majestic One, start calling him the fear. Oh, or not. I think it's awesome. But he, we are made in his image. We have personhood. That's why we have names. In the Bible, the, the, the greater person names the lesser person. Okay? The person, what you might say, has greater status, so to speak, is the one who names the person who doesn't have the greater status. Okay? You have Jesus who renamed Simon into Peter. You have, uh, you have God renaming Abram to be Abraham. You have him renaming his wife from Sarai to Sarah. You have Jacob being renamed by God to Israel over and over again. You can even read in the book of Revelation, Jesus says that I will give to him who overcomes a white stone with a new name on it. He told the church of Sardis, whoever overcomes, I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my father and his angels. Names are important. Imagine that when you are standing before God the Father and Jesus Christ, the one who is the beloved of the Father, in the bosom of the Father, stands and looks at his Father and he names your name to him. And in naming your name, he names you to show that you belong to him, that you are accepted. He's one of mine. He knows your name. Isn't there a song? He knows my name. I'm asking. I really think there is, isn't there? Yeah, I didn't, I was. So Eve does not remain nameless, nor does she name herself. This is critical. This is critical, and it's fitting in with the whole theme of what's going on here, because she was created to be her husband's helpmate, not his head. The act of naming is an act of his husbandly authority over her. There's two reasons why this is important that she didn't name herself. Number one is what I just said, is that it is an expression of his headship over his wife to give her a name. Okay? And that she, here, this is important, it is also important because there is now introduced into their relationship alienation, and by naming her and doing something so personal to give her a name, it sort of counters that alienation. It brings, it, 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 it mitigates against that, that, that somehow that division that has been introduced into their relationship to sort of tie them together in an intimacy. Here's the point of what I'm saying is by naming her, she belongs to him and he belongs to her. So you have these two counter things, ha forces happening in their relationship. A pushing away, a hiding, a separation, a, 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 a concealing from one another, this alienation, there's that impulse, but then at the same time, there is, they belong together. And it's very intimate and personal. So you have those two things happening. So Adam names her. But now the, the part that I love in this verse is that 
When Adam gives her the name Eve, which means living, it explains in the verse why her name Eve was given. Because she would become the mother of all the living. And I'm going to stand up here today and I want to make an argument for this idea of her being the mother has two senses and those whom are the living has two senses. And the first sense is this. It's the very obvious sense that everybody who would be born after Adam and Eve, she is the mother of all of them. Do you know what that means? It means that no matter who your mom is today, all of us ultimately, we trace it back far enough, we all go back to Eve. Okay? We all have the same physical mother. We, she would have all of humanity to be her descendants. And she is the mother, therefore, of all those who would be born and become living amongst humanity on the face of the earth. So when basically Adam and Eve did what they were supposed to do when God commanded them to be fruitful and multiply, all of those results, we'll call them, were the living that she would be the mother of. So physically, in a sense, she was the mother of all the living. But I think that the words press further here, and I'm going to make an argument that mother and living means something more, and they mean that she is the spiritual mother of all those who would spiritually be alive. And why do I make that case? Do you remember when Jesus said in Mark chapter 12, he was speaking to those clowns, the Sadducees, those guys who didn't believe in a resurrection or anything immaterial beyond the physical world, he said to them, you boys got it bad. You're really messing this up. He didn't say it that way, but that's essentially what he said. And this is what he said specifically, though. God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And as you read what Jesus says, and you read that interaction between them, you realize he is not talking about people who are physically alive and physically dead. He is talking about people who were spiritually alive. God is the God of those who are living spiritually, who are spiritually alive, who have eternal life, who are righteous in his sight, who are in his presence and in the presence experiencing his blessings. And who did he say in that verse and in that text to the Sadducees? He said, he said that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is, is, is who God is the God of. And Jesus' point is those guys aren't dead. They're alive in the presence of God. Just like if you have a loved one who believes and who has passed on, they're not dead. They are alive in the presence of the living God right now. He is their God. They are his. The righteous in his sight. Now, now where does this go? What this means is, is, that, is that the phrase mother of all the living has a second reference and means that Eve is spiritually the mother of all those who are saved and who are alive to God in Christ, Christ who is her offspring. Remember that there are, we saw last week that there are two kinds of human beings. There's only two in this world. You can categorize them however else you want. But there are only two kinds of human beings. There are those who belong to Satan who are unsaved and in their sin, and there are those who belong to God, whose sins are not counted against them. Those are the only two categories that really, when you draw your last breath, that's the only thing that matters. Any other distinction, any other category you might have, any other sort of identity you might have, it does not matter when you draw your last breath, because when you draw your last breath, what waits on the other side is, is do you belong to the God that you are about to face? Or when you face him, is his face turned against you? It's the only two options. Those are two. So, so those whom God's face is turned against are those who belong to Satan, the offspring, the seed, if you will, of the serpent we saw in the previous uh, verses. And then there are those who, are, who belong to Christ, who, are, who belong to him who is the offspring of the woman. Those who are living compared to those who are dead. You're like, man, you're nuts. You're making this stuff up. I'm not making this up. You know why? Because I'm going to make my argument even stronger. Have you ever heard of a guy named Abraham? Yeah, Abraham is known as the man of faith. 
Abraham is the man in all of history that, listen to me, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, no matter what time period you live in in history, if you believe in God as he has revealed himself, and if you trust in him as God and have, have, have believed his revelation of who he is, you have faith and you are called and considered a child of Abraham because of your faith. It's like Abraham's. We talked about this last week, but I want you to see something. Go to Genesis chapter 15. We're going to hop to some verses here. Go to Genesis chapter 15. You're going to see two things. You're going to see Abraham's physical children who would come after him. You're going to see his faith. So two very important things you have to see. Chapter 15, verse 4, and we'll read through 6. Then the word of the Lord came to Abraham. This man, Abraham, your servant, okay? This man, your servant, will not be your heir. I know you're childless, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. That's a promise that God gave Abraham. And Abraham had no earthly reason to believe that promise was possible to come true. The dude was old. And Sarai was not old, mature. He took him outside. God took Abram outside and he said, look up to the heavens and count the stars, Abram. Abram. If indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. The physical descendants of Abraham were going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Later, he would say as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Now, verse 6. Watch what it happens. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord, based on Abraham's faith, considered Abram righteous. Faith was the basis of his righteous standing before God. Now, I want you to understand something, okay? The physical descendants that would come from Abraham would become who we know as the Israelites, the nation of Israel. And those 12 tribes would, 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 would grow and become this whole nation. Now, here's the thing. The Bible says that not all of the physical descendants of Abraham are his spiritual children. Go to the book of Romans with me. Romans chapter 9. Okay, now you have, you have to understand, you have physical children of Abraham who trace their lineage back to Abraham, and then you have those who are spiritual children of Abraham. Verse 7 and 8. Nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. Descendants and children, two different words, and they're intentionally used. Descendants refers to physical lineage. Children refer to likeness, sameness, similarity. Not everybody who are his descendants are Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. Okay? It's like it says in chapter 2. You don't have to go there, but listen. A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew, in other words, a descendant of Abraham, if he is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but it is from God. His point is this, is that, yes, people may be a physical descendant of Abraham, but they are not like Abraham in their faith unless they have faith like like Abraham. And if you understand this concept of a physical Jew 
believing on God's revelation and, and, and believing in God the way Abraham believed in God, you will come to understand the concept of a true Jew, okay, of, of the true Israel of God, that it is those who both in physical and in spiritual matters, they are like Abraham. They are children and descendants of Abraham, and they have the faith of Abraham. In other words, they not only have the blood of Abraham running in their veins, but they also have the faith of Abraham, okay, believing in God in their hearts. So you have descendants physically and you have those spiritually. And my point is, is this dual fatherhood of Abraham can be seen in Eve too with her dual motherhood. You're like, man, you're making a lot out of this. Why? Because my question is, is Eve your mother? My question is, are you among the living? Because God is the God of the living. And you are either dead in your sins, Ephesians 2 says, and you are separated from the life of God that is in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2 goes on to say, or you are no longer in your sins, but you are brought near to God. You have been made alive by the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness of God that is in Jesus Christ, and you now before him belong to him, and he is the God of you, one of the living. What are you? Is Eve your mother? She's the one who is the mother of all living. The second thing that we see that happens is they get new clothes, okay? I think we've really nailed down verse 20, don't you think? You're like, Man, move on, pal. We're moving. Verse 21, new clothes. Okay, so in verse, we're in Romans, let's get back here. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. We really should just preach this one verse right here. While Adam named Eve, God did not leave the issue of clothing with them. And he took charge on this matter. Adam got to name Eve, but they didn't get to clothe themselves. So let me immediately point out a couple things here. First of all, it really does highlight the insufficiency of their attempt to cover themselves up. If their fig leaves in verse 7 that it says that they sewed together and covered themselves with, if those were adequate, God wouldn't have given them new clothes. God would have said, hey, good job, you did a good job. We'll go with what you did. They needed clothes from God. So application, you can't clothe yourself either. I mean, you may look good today. Well, you may come into church and got some, some sweet threads on, but you can't clothe yourself spiritually. You need God to cover you. Secondly, the very fact that God made them clothing means that he didn't leave them naked. He didn't leave them in their own poor attempts to cover themselves. And my point really with this is that God didn't leave them. Rather than ghosting them in the garden and disappearing... God actually pursues them. He draws closer to them. Even though in his holiness he is repelled by sin, in his love he draws near. Not casting away into some, some abandoned abyss where he will never see them again and want nothing to do with them. No, God, in, in all of this you see this, this persistent, and you could call it tenacious, faithfulness of God to be devoted to people who don't want to be devoted to him. He pursues when we run. He seeks when we, are, when, we are, when we are running away and want nothing to do with him. God's faithfulness, here, here's, the way I was, here's the way I was thinking of it and I wrote it down is, Adam will never be able to say to God what God said to him when he was hiding in the trees. Adam will never be able to say, God, where are you? Because God doesn't leave. He doesn't abandon. He doesn't quit. So he didn't leave them naked. And here's the application. God doesn't abandon you. God does not abandon you. God is faithful to you. And he loves you. Now, will you please also take note of the clothing that God made for them? Look what it says in verse 21. 
it says animal skin. It says skin, the skin of an animal. It doesn't say, but I really think it would be fitting, wouldn't you think, if it was a lamb? Wouldn't that be perfect if he took a lamb? Okay, here's what he did. You got to imagine Adam was created to care for the animals. He's the one who named the animals. And what God did in this moment is he took one of those animals that no doubt Adam had seen personally with his eyes, interacted with, probably held it, fed it, named it, pet it, and was, his, and was attached to it in some way. And then he watched as God killed the first being in creation. I don't think God went somewhere else with this animal to kill it, but right in front of Adam and Eve's eyes, he would have slaughtered that animal. You've got to understand something. Blood. The horror that must have struck Adam. Adam wasn't conditioned to violence through TV and movies and video games and having been through war. Adam was pure. Adam was virgin. Adam, was, Adam had innocent eyes and had never seen any violence whatsoever, even though spiritual violence had just been done to him through Satan. He did not know what physical violence was. Could you imagine the shock of God wrenching on that animal? What did Jim quote before that song? There is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood without the shedding of blood so we have right here god making a mess with this animal and then taking that skin and giving it to them to cover themselves with there are a whole lot of things to pull out here number one god you'll notice did not add more leaves to their covering this is really important to understand. This is the way my brain works. You got to go with it because you're sitting in here and I'm the one preaching, okay? But he did not add to more leaves, meaning he did not say, hey, you've got a good thing started. You just need some help to finish the job. And between you and me, we can provide you with an adequate covering. No, God said, get those off stripped them naked and then the thing that he provided the skin that he provided that was the covering that they were supposed to wear that was what what god judged to be you could say appropriate for them to appropriately cover their shame it was god who needed to provide for it application you have to rip away anything you are doing yourself so that based on what you think you're doing for yourself, you can be right with God. You've got to rip that away. You have to accept the covering that God gives and stop covering yourself with what you do. Stop fig leafing. Second, it was not a human sacrifice, was it? It was not a human skin that was offered here. It was an animal. And this is the second indication that God has given in these verses that a man will be spared from his sins by a substitute who would die in his place. The first was the striking of the woman's seeds. Uh, excuse me, the striking of the heel of the woman's seed. And then that woman's seed would turn around and crush the head of the serpent. Now we see that to cover over the shame of sin Rather than killing Adam and Eve, right then and there, God kills someone else in their place. It wasn't that animal that, that sinned. It was an innocent animal. You could say an animal without blemish, spot, or stain which would later be codified into the Mosaic law where you were not to offer any lamb or goat or bull or anything that somehow was injured or flawed, but it had to be perfect. You bring to God the best. Don't you bring him something that's, that's somehow deformed in some way. You bring him the best. You see the idea running right from Genesis 3 on through the rest of the Bible that there would be a substitute for man, man who sinned, someone else who had not sinned, who was without blemish and without fault, would be the substitute in his place and pay the penalty that man actually deserved. It begins right here in Genesis 3. Substitutionary atonement. Don't you buy that social justice garbage that says substitutionary atonement isn't the meaning of the cross. The meaning of the cross began right here in the garden. Right here in the garden. 
We have to notice here, too, that this is only one of two sacrifices God has ever performed. God provided the sufficient sacrifice with the first Adam, and then with what 1 Corinthians 15 says is the last Adam, Jesus Christ, God performed his last sacrifice, his second and last sacrifice. The institution of animal sacrifice is seen right here in Genesis chapter 3. From Genesis chapter 3 on, we are going to see that part and parcel with religious worship in human history is going to be animal sacrifice. Pagans practice animal sacrifice, yes, but they practice it to the wrong God. People, if they still practice animal sacrifice, sure they do it, but it's all illegitimate because every animal that was sacrificed to God in history was an anticipation and a foreshadow of the one sacrifice that would come who would be called the Lamb of God. So when that Lamb was offered, and when Jesus Christ paid the penalty on the cross like that for our sins, what happened was all other animal sacrifices became null and void. They have no purpose anymore because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. I want to press the point a little bit further. The first sacrifice in the garden was to clothe sinful man. It made atonement, meaning to cover over. Adam and Eve were covered in shame because of their sin, and their shame needed covering. And you see that in the animal skin. But... That animal, and as Hebrews says, no animal can cleanse. The defilement of sin is only cleansed through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You have been made pure, 1 Peter says. You have been cleansed, Paul says. The book of Hebrews says your conscience has been washed clean. Titus chapter 3, you have been washed in the rebirth and renewing by the Holy Spirit. You have, all of the New Testament is talking to us, you guys, in reference to the fact that while sin defiles us and makes us impure before a holy God, the blood of Jesus shed for us when he died on the cross for our sins has washed us clean. Not merely covering over so that what is unclean is underneath, but now it's just covered over. I'll give you an illustration. So, I know someone who has uh, a favorite button-up shirt, and it has a rip in the elbow, and he can't wear it without covering it up. So he has to wear a, a dark-colored jacket when he's preaching. <laughs> like, he doesn't want to give the shirt up. He loves the shirt. But he can't not cover up the blemish. So he puts something over top. I'm not saying it's me, but he puts something over top of it so that it's covered. It's there. I'm not mine, but it's there, that guy's. But it's covered and you can't see it. So it's easier on our eyes or however, whatever benefit you want to talk about when we're talking. Not everybody's looking at it and going, oh, nice rip in your shirt. You know, why don't you get a shirt that isn't ripped? Nothing. It's covered up. Everybody thinks everything's normal. That's what the covering did in the Old Testament. It merely covered over our sins. The true cleansing and the true washing and the true stripping away and purification that happens is done through the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus' death on the cross washes clean. Some people are trying as hard as they can with those scrubbing brushes on their life to be a better person, right? I'm scrubbing my life. I'm going to do good. I'm going to make up for all the bad that I've done. I'm going to clean my act up. That's where that phrase comes from. That's where that concept comes from. You cannot clean up your act. You can't. You have to be cleansed. You, by the act of Jesus Christ and believing on him and what he has done for you and his love for you, that, through his act, is how you are cleansed. It's the difference from looking in the mirror and straining hard to be a better me 
And instead, looking with your eyes to someone else, someone who has done it for you, who can do it for you, and if you would, he will do it for you. The Bible says, though, that once we are cleansed, we are to actually get clothed. And this is where this idea in the Bible comes up, where it talks about clothe yourselves with Jesus Christ. Uh, if you will, go to Romans chapter 13. Where are we at on time? Okay, we're good. Romans 13. Romans 13, the very last verse, in Romans 13, it says this. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Pause and listen to what Galatians 3 says. Galatians 3 says, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. This idea in the scriptures of clothing ourselves with Jesus, this clothing is not, here's the, here's the key, this is what I love about this. This is where my brain was this week. In the garden, clothing was meant to cover up and hide. We all do that, don't we? We all have things we want to hide, and so we cover it up. We have things about us that we try and conceal, okay? But the clothing that we Christians are to put on, that is, we put on Jesus Christ, is not meant to hide something, but to display outward something. To display and to manifest through our lives the Lord Jesus Christ and his holiness and his character and his, his perfection and his righteousness. That should be seen. In other words, clothing is not meant to conceal, but clothing instead is meant to reveal. Reveal Jesus Christ to a watching world around. Jesus wants to see Jesus in us. He wants to see who he is coming through in us. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I now live by faith in Christ Jesus, who loved me and who gave himself for me, Galatians 2.20. You notice how it's like, I'm not living, Christ is living. I'm clothing my life with Jesus Christ. This is the idea of a living sacrifice, by the way. In, in, in Romans 12, it says that we're supposed to be living sacrifices, where we live our life sacrificially to the glory of God, that we deny gratification of our sinful nature. We deny living for our sinful natures. We, we choose right rather than choosing wrong. We renounce that old sinful way in Adam, and we take up as much difficulty as it may be, and in total dependence on the power of the Spirit and the Word of God working in us towards righteousness, right? It's all sacrificial living for Jesus. It's a living sacrifice. In, the, in, in prior to Christ, the sacrifice of death was given through animals and required blood, but this is a sacrifice of living that we do. In other words, whereas a death sacrifice kills to please God, a living sacrifice lives to please God. Living to please him. You guys had your coffee? Like I said at the beginning, let's finish chapter 3 next week. <laughs> Do you know that God loves you? I mean, we can't plumb the depths of God's anger towards sin. There's, it's just, 
if you want a visual of the anger of God towards sin. Death. But how do you even begin to plumb the depth of his love at the same time? same place. The holy anger that a holy God has towards sin demanded death. The holy love of that God brought in a sacrifice, a substitute, a someone else besides us sinners. How do you comprehend God's love? Comprehend it right here. For God so loved the world. He loved you. That he gave his one and only son. So that whoever, if you, would believe on him you would not perish but you would have everlasting life you would become living do you believe on him people are dying every day in wars from diseases accidents it's not old people that are dying it's old people and everybody. You don't know if today is your last day. I've said that in the pulpit before, and literally a week later, someone who was in our congregation visiting was dead. You don't know how short your time is. Consider it short. And seek the God who... Seek the God who is seeking you and seeking to give you everlasting life. Father in heaven, you give life where there is death. We are dead in sins and transgressions, but through Christ Jesus, you have made us alive. And Lord, the call goes out. You have put the call out to the world for men and for women to believe on the name of your son, Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, today that people would hear that call and they would come. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand to sing in closing.